absolute pleasure to be here talking to you tonight. And um, I hope everyone uh, around the world who's listening to this is uh, staying nice and safe in these uh, difficult times. Um, so I, what I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, something that I feel really passionate about, and uh, that is uh, minimally invasive calcaneal fracture fixation. Um, I've got just some acknowledgements. Um, uh, Dr. Greg Berry, who was my fellowship supervisor for my trauma fellowship in Canada, and, um, the, and, and Dr. Christian uh, Rodemund, who uh, this is his uh, minimally invasive technique um, that, I, uh, that, that I've been utilising. Um, uh, in terms of background, um, I am an uh, orthopaedic surgeon uh, trained in Australia um, who has a particular interest in foot and ankle surgery and trauma. Um, and when uh, doing my uh, trauma fellowship in Canada, um, the, uh, the surgeons there uh, were uh, particularly keen on uh, minimally invasive calcaneal fracture fixation. And um, through that process, um, uh, this is uh, where it's uh, led me today. So uh, we'll be talking a little bit about calcaneal fractures uh, this evening. And um, the, when I first learned how to fix calcaneal fractures, it was uh, via the, the technique that you see uh, on the left here with the uh, extensile approach and uh, large soft tissue dissections, high rates of uh, wound complications having to wait until uh, soft tissue beds were, um, were acceptable and uh, would allow you to perform large operations, uh, which meant that uh, often fracture uh, reduction was difficult in partially united fractures. And I was uh, finding myself that I had to, to osteotomize fractures and it, would, uh, it was a very challenging operation and certainly not something that I really looked forward to. Um, so for, for me, the, the indications for performing a minimally invasive uh, technique for fixation and re uh, reduction and fixation are really uh, displaced calcaneal fractures um, that are suitable for a minimally invasive technique um, that ideally uh, I can get to uh, within three days of their injury. Um, and the this technique is so minimally invasive that I'm very happy to do this irrespective of the amount of soft tissue swelling um, that, the, that this patient has. Because really what, what I'm trying to do is um, restore the normal anatomy of the calcaneum and the heel. Um, and uh, that's uh, certainly beneficial for the soft tissue envelope as evidenced uh, by the, this, this picture that you see here on the right where the, um, the, the tuberosity fragment is um, tenting the skin and uh, that's a, a person who I'm really concerned about as there's an area of threatened skin there. Um, so for me, uh, I think it's really important that you, um, that these patients get set up properly and you need to make sure that um, the, that you can actually obtain adequate intraoperative uh, radiographs. Uh, for me, I like to place a tourniquet on the thigh, um, place the patient in a lateral position, and then bring them um, as close to the, um, uh, the, uh, the back of the bed as possible. And that allows their leg to, to dangle out in free space. I then use a, um, a support um, where I can uh, place the calf um, and um, uh, it allows me to, to get the, uh, the radiographs that I need to do. Um, so when you're um, positioning the patient, um, there's really only three x-rays that, that, you, that you need to get. Um, one of those is the, the lateral x-ray, which you can see the, the radiographers performing here. Um, the second is a Broden view performed with the, um, the image intensifier in approximately 30 degrees of rotation. And then the third X-ray is a, a Harris heel view. And um, this is performed with the image intensifier uh, parallel with the floor. And as you can see, I've got my registrar here who is uh, holding the knee in some slight extension um, to, 
uh, to allow a, a better X-ray um, of the uh, the calcaneum. Um, I find that this um, uh, soft tissue retractor, uh, sorry, soft tissue um, support that you see here that allows the knee to be extended slightly um, really has made it a little bit easier to get that uh, Harris heel view. Um, and that's what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate with this picture. So rather than having a, a U-shaped gutter, which really locks the, uh, the lower leg or the shin in position, uh, a more flat style um, uh, bolster uh, does allow a bit of knee extension and a, a better uh, Harris heel x-ray. Um, this is a, a case of mine. So what we're looking at is the, um, uh, the lateral x-ray and um, what I like to do is using image intensification, I, I mark on the, the site that I'm going to place two uh, traction pins um, and these pins are inserted uh, from the lateral side uh, directly through so that they protrude uh, from the medial side of the foot. And the location of those pins is uh, one centred in the tail ahead and then the second is centered in the calcaneal tuberosity so that the, uh, the axis between those two points is perpendicular to the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. Um, after marking these, um, uh, these two landmarks on the patient, as you can see uh, with the, the picture on the right, uh, what I use uh, two, um, two millimeter K wires that then get passed through the foot. And uh, the, the K wire that is passed uh, through the head of the talus is passed perpendicular uh, to the foot. And then the K wire that is passed through the tuberosity of the calcaneum is passed perpendicular to the axis of the calcaneum as you see it on the Harris heel view. And uh, with a typical uh, fracture pattern that we see with the um, calcaneum, uh, we see that the, these are usually in varus. And so the, the, the wires are divergent on the lateral side and convergent on the medial side. So that when the, uh, I place uh, the distractor on, um, there's uh, a greater amount of distraction on the medial side, which corrects the varus of the heel. Um, we've got this uh, distraction device, as you can see here, which is placed on both sides of the foot. Um, and then um, the, uh, the, uh, the distract uh, distraction is placed across the two pins, um, of which there's always you know, more on the medial side until those pins become parallel. And then as you further increase traction on those pins, it causes the heel to reduce via ligamentotaxis. So you can see um, the, the displaced lateral wall uh, on this image here. And then as you start to apply uh, soft tissue uh, traction via the pins, you can actually see that that, uh, that lateral wall reduces in the tuberosity uh, position and the, uh, the varus is restored into a, a more anatomical position. After doing this, uh, the next step is to reduce the articular surface. And I like to do this uh, by making a small incision under II guidance on the lateral side of the foot um, at the approximate point that I would like to introduce a, a tamp in order to elevate the, uh, the articular fragments. Um, and I do that um, by using, uh, by marking on the foot, um, making a small five millimeter incision. And then I like to use uh, the, the countersink drill uh, for one of the screws that I'll show you in the moment um, in order to uh, create a small hole in the lateral um, uh, inferior wall of the calcaneum and that allows me to introduce a fine instrument. Um, I've moved away from using the TAMP and in the actual fact the, the, the instrument that I've been using the most is believe it or not the depth gauge uh, for the, uh, the seven millimeter cannulated screws. Um, because 
there's a significant amount of distraction that's being placed across the, uh, the subtalar joint, uh, the reduction of these articular fragments is usually quite simple and really requires very little force um, because all of the uh, joint reaction force has been taken off uh, by the distractors. Um, then once I've elevated those um, uh, joint fragments and confirmed that reduction on both the lateral x-ray and on the Broden view, that the, the view that's taken at approximately 30 degrees, um, I pass a, uh, a single K-wire from the lateral side of the foot at the um, tip of the fibula uh, across the articular fragments and then into the constant fragment, the sinus tarsi. Um, over this, I then place a cannulated screw and then uh, depending on the uh, particular fracture configuration, I would usually place uh, two large uh, seven uh, millimetre uh, fully threaded screws um, so that they raft the sinus tarsi and support the, uh, the articular reduction. And this is what they look like. Seen here. Uh, following this, um, I close the wounds with a, a non-dissolving nylon suture. Um, I place them in a, a back slab for two weeks. And then at two weeks, I review the wounds and then place them into a cam boot, non-weight bearing, uh, until the six week mark and uh, with x-rays to confirm uh, radiographic uh, union before allowing weight bearing. Uh, this is an example of what the, uh, the incisions look like uh, at the six week mark. And you can see that uh, even in this gentleman who is a, a type two diabetic, uh, what I would consider a high risk patient uh, for a, um, a calcaneal fracture um, because of the uh, very small size of all of the wounds, um, it's uh, very unlikely to have any wound issues. Um, some of the challenges for me throughout this process uh, have really been uh, trying to find equipment and uh, it, to, to perform the operation that, I, that I've been trying to do. Um, the very first one of these I used, uh, I used a, a, a femoral distractor, um, which did provide a good reduction, but uh, was very bulky and very difficult to use. Um, I was then uh, able to look through the double medical uh, catalog and find some instruments uh, that I thought would uh, be suitable for performing this type of uh, uh, operation and uh, they've since become available and uh, we've now uh, put a little kit together which has got uh, the distractor, the screws on it um, and it is uh, certainly much easier. Um, uh, because the vast majority uh, of this operation is really performed percutaneously, it does uh, require a uh, a significant understanding of the, the calcaneal uh, anatomy, and it also requires a significant understanding of the fracture morphology. Um, I think the, the most difficult screw to insert is that that goes uh, through the uh, articular fragments and into the constant fragment. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that the trajectory of this screw in the coronal plane is approximately 30 degrees anterior. Uh, so when you're inserting this screw, um, you do need to be uh, aiming anteriorly uh, towards that uh, uh, sustentaculum uh, in order to get the screw into the correct position. Um, and it is important that you, you check this uh, KY on uh, both the Broden view and the Harris heel view, uh, because if you are uh, aim this screw too inferiorly, you do place the medial neurovascular bundle at risk and uh, you have to be careful of that. Um, the other thing that I think is uh, certainly worthwhile and um, something that I've found 
uh, particularly useful when I first uh, started doing these was asking for a, a 3D reconstruction of the calcaneum um, with the, the surrounding bones uh, removed from that reconstruction so that you can uh, understand the fracture morphology as you see it in front of you and you can plan how you intend to move the individual fragments into their reduced position and I think having uh, a good uh, game plan and have, having studied that CT scan before you start the operation certainly um, it makes the first few of these that you do um, much simpler given the, the complex calcaneal anatomy. Um, I would like to share some cases with you, um, just so that you can um, uh, see some of the different uh, fixation techniques that, uh, that you can employ, and um, just to give you an idea about uh, some of the uh, reductions that you're able to achieve using this technique. Um, so I don't always just use a single uh, sinus tarsi screw. Um, I think in the setting of um, uh, large uh, joint fragments, it's often uh, beneficial to get, uh, get two rafting screws ac uh, across the articular surface. Um, and um, you can see the, the strength that this technique has in terms of reducing the varus of the hind foot just by applying traction uh, across that tuberosity for, Um, another case here and um, fairly significant lateral wall blowout and shortening of the heel again um, brought out to, to length quite nicely um, and the reason I like to use the uh, fully threaded screws is that these are non-compressive and they really um, work to maintain that reduction that you've achieved with your traction device so in the top right corner, uh, the, the screw that goes from the, the tuberosity um, towards the subtalar joint is really uh, working to hold those two pieces of bones apart, um, reducing the lateral wall via ligament ataxis and allowing the calcaneum to heal in an anatomical position. Again, fairly significant impaction that's uh, distracted really nicely using this technique. Um, and fairly um, uh, impressive correction of the, the varus that happens at the heel. Um, not all calcaneal fractures have an intra-articular component. Um, this is a, a fracture that uh, was extra-articular at the um, subtalar joint, and so it doesn't need to have that uh, um, rafting screw, uh, but the two screws certainly do hold the calcaneum in, a, um, in, in an anatomical position to allow bony union. Uh, for patients who have uh, almost like a tongue type um, uh, fracture pattern, um, starting the screws in that um, uh, proximal fragment and aiming them inferiorly um, not only rafts the, the articular surface at the um, uh, subtalar joint but it also provides adequate fixation uh, for uh, that, the, the tongue fragment. In terms of uh, some of the complications, um, I'm quite happy to do this on all patients, smokers, diabetics, um, patients who have um, significant soft tissue swelling um, and at this to, to date I, I haven't had any um, wound complications uh, and I think the I think that speaks to this technique and to the um, the, the very small incisions that are required to uh, uh, obtain and maintain an uh, anatomical reduction uh, and I have had one neurological injury um, which was a patient who had uh, significant calcaneal varus and the as I applied the traction on the medial side um, of the the foot to correct that varus um, uh, I'd actually uh, got to the extent 
uh, that the, the skin or the soft tissue on the medial side would allow. Um, and um, I had to make an, a small incision in the skin. Um, and I think I have uh, picked up a, a damaged a, a cutaneous nerve when I did that. Um, so they've had a little bit of paresthesia, but no ongoing um, uh, neurological um, uh, 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 symptoms following that. Um, <laughs> in terms of advice, uh, for people who uh, are interested in taking up this technique, um, pick an easy one first. Um, pick a Sanders 2 or at most a Sanders 3 uh, with a preferably one large articular fragment that can be easily reduced. Uh, do it early. Um, the, 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 the strength in this technique is its ability to um, allow a simple reduction of a difficult complex fracture. Um, by doing it early, you are allowing those um, the, the fracture fragments to be mobile and easily moved. Um, and if the, the longer you wait, uh, the less you are able to distract the calcaneum and the, the harder it is to maintain that anatomical reduction. And in someone who has soft bone, you do run the risk of uh, cutting out the wire um, in someone who is a you, who you've left for 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 tender for over a week. Um, I try to get a three D reconstruction for all uh, of the uh, the fractures that I are of, um, so that I have a, an understanding of this uh, the unique fracture pattern um, particular to that patient, and so that I'm also able to plan my screw trajectory and insertion. And um, I like to have looked at that beforehand so that during the operation, I'm merely just performing my plan rather than trying to determine how I'm going to reduce a fracture while the patient's anaesthetized with a tourniquet on. Um, I think it is very useful to have a, uh, a model of a foot when you first start so that you can look at the, the anatomy of the calcaneum and you understand where you're aiming your screws at. And, um, as I said before, you need to have planned your reduction and fixation before the patient's asleep and anaesthetized. You want to spend your surgical time uh, performing your preoperative plan rather than trying to figure out how to reduce a fracture um, in an operative setting. In terms of where we're heading to next, um, the we've been... Uh, working on the, um, the the large screws in order to make them uh, uh, better for cutting, uh, less compressive and more supportive of the surrounding bone. Um, we've got a, a radio lucent retractor you know, in the works uh, so that uh, you don't get the interference with the um, the image intensifier when you're assessing your articular reduction. Um, and we're also looking into different uh, reduction tamps in order to assist with articular um, uh, surface reduction. I think that's my time up. Um, I'm very happy to, to open it up to questions now.